Great, excellent. Okay, so we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about some of our work that has been done in our lab at Purdue University. Uh, we've heard a little bit about CAR T cells and immunotherapy and immunoresistance in glioblastoma. So today's talk will be more about uh, natural killer cells and how we can develop immunotherapies for brain tumors with this new effector type of the immune cells and how are they different from a CAR T cell and what can they do against brain tumors um, uh, that uh, that other cells potentially cannot do or at least what's the promise of therapy. There are some disclosures here that I want to just um, highlight uh, and of course the goals here are going to be to really um, talk to you about some really emerging and kind of brand new modalities for therapy with engineered immune cells that are not only based on cell therapy, uh, but really looking at cell therapy as a tool that can be combined with other th therapeutic interventions, including checkpoint inhibitors, including other therapies, a small molecule inhibitors of metabolism that we've tested, uh, for example, uh, as treatments for, um, for brain tumors. But we know, of course, that the brain is not for a long time, it was considered an immune privilege site, so a uh, lack of immune system, but really it's immunologically distinct. It has a functional lymphatic system, and I think the immune activity uh, and the presence of effector immune cells is there. So we have detected T cells and NK cells and other immune cells uh, in the brain. Um, the, what happens is that um, the environment for immunotherapy implementation is there. What happens is that there's levels of immune exclusion in terms of immunosuppression that actively work to dampen the present immune system. And sort of what we're interested in immunotherapy is sort of reinvigorating the present immune system and maybe bringing in new effector immune cells through drugs um, to sort of invigorate or supercharge, so to speak, uh, the, um, the therapeutic environment of brain tumors. Um, so what we do know is that cell-based therapy for brain tumors, I think that everybody's sort of familiar with this concept, is where we're looking at either allogeneic or autologous therapy, right? We're, we have six CAR-T products on the market. They're autologous products where, of course, they're manufactured from the blood of the donor, um, provides the cells. The cells are then frozen and then shipped um, to be genetically engineered. They are genetically engineered typically with CARs. Uh, this is the most the simplest, the most um, common concept that most people have um, with um, chimeric energy receptor therapy. They're then expanded for anything from a few days to a couple of weeks to get the doses for the patient in there, uh, and patients are treated. There have been some remarkable responses with CAR-T therapy against uh, brain tumors uh, that have uh, that have treated uh, that have been treated with intracranial injections of CAR-T cells. Uh, when we talk about NK cells, we really look at the same type of immune effector cell uh, in the sense that it can be engineered in the same way, and they can be sourced from the peripheral blood of the donor, but the um, uh, the the benefit of the cells that they have other uh, other other sources that can be used to manufacture these therapies for patients that don't rely on administration of um, of drawing the blood of the patient and which sort of it becomes really more attractive to think about brain tumor cell based therapy as a allogeneic treatment that can be manufactured a little easier than sort of relying on that. Um, so when we look at clinical trials in, in GBM um, for with CAR T cells, we have of course CGFRV three. Um, very common IL 13 R alpha. These are the two most common because very specific for tumor. They're not only excluded for tumors, but they're quite specific for cancer. We have other emerging targets, uh, B7H3, GD2. There's been some remarkable, especially in pediatric brain tumors, um, GD2, um, some responses and really low toxicity, which is remarkable compared to other tumors. There are others that were started in the lab, CD73, um, HER2, uh, and so on and so forth. And they all provide various types of targeting of environments uh, in the brain tumor um, that hopefully uh, with the goal being of eradication of the cancer. Again, a lot of these targets have various heterogeneous expression over different tumors. And so the specificity of the CAR therapies that are designed around them really depend on the ability um, to um, lack this receptor um, in any other environment except um, really the tumor. Um, so I, we've talked, uh, I mentioned NK cells, and I think I've, I've We've talked today a lot about T cell therapy. Um, we know the T cells are adaptive immunity. So when they're infused into a patient, these cells are going to persist for a long time. Uh, their responses are also adaptive. So they require antigen presentation so they don't respond right away to a pathogen. NK cells, why are we using them for therapy of brain cancer patients? Is, uh, they're part of the innate immune system. That means they're always on. They're not specific for a certain antigen. So they are uh, activated within a few hours of pathogen infection and they have a very strong ability of eliminating a GBM and tumor cells. They work on the basis of non-self-recognition. They're short-lived. The short-lived is part of the 
a therapy consideration, a patient who received an injection of NK cells, these cells are going to most likely disappear within a couple of weeks within the patient's circulation or a local tumor environment, for example, in the brain, because they don't have the ability to, or the capacity to persist for a long time. For that reason, when we use NK cells in, in any kind of therapy, we are looking at ways in which we can enhance their persistence by either adding cytokines, IL-15 is a very popular one, or either exogenously by infusing the patient with cytokines, or when it comes to the case of brain tumors, you really are looking at ways in which we, you can think about, um, if you don't want to do multiple injections, think about engineering the cells to actually be self-persistent without generating lo local toxicities in the brain. T cells, of course, because they're low, um, they're long persisting, they don't have the problem of, um, of persistent, but they do have a problem of, um, of, uh, uh, of activation over time that uh, can generate toxicity after the tumor has been um, sort of has been either eradicated or eliminated or reduced. And this is why you'll see a lot of the approved CAR-T therapies that are engineering various suicide genes and elements that can switch off essentially CAR-T activation uh, at the tumor after the cell is done what it's supposed to do. Now, this is a pretty dense slide, but the, the idea being that when, a, when an NK cell is in environment is faced with another cell, it has a few decision points to go through. And those decisions it will ultimately, uh, and those choices will ultimately lead to a decision whether the cell will kill or not kill the antigen. For those of you who've done a lot of immunology, this is pretty basic, right? There's a missing self is one of the main hypotheses, not the only one, or the main one um, behind what drives an anchor cell to kill the pathogen, so the brain cancer cell. So here you see various scenarios that are built around two main two main points. One is missing self. The NK cell will recognize the lack of MHC class one as a missing self meaning the cell that is in front of it is not its own. Um, it doesn't look like itself. And so it will be stimulated to kill. Then the ultimate decision whether the cell will kill the brain tumor cell will be whether the balance of receptors, meaning proteins on the NK cell surface are in favor of the cell being um, triggered to kill uh, or inhibited. So there's activated inhibitor receptors, the activating receptors um, drive it to kill the inhibitor um, they inhibit its killing. And so the balance between missing self and activating ligands is what is going to drive the cell to kill a cancer cell. If the balance is in favor of inhibition, which happens a lot with checkpoint inhibitor um, deactivation and microenvironment cues, the, 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 the cell will not kill the cancer cell. And so the cell will inhibit it. That happens a lot in cancer. In brain tumor, we see a lot of inhibition. And so the inhibitor receptors dominate and the cell is not able to, to sort of eliminate, um, eliminate the cell and kill it. Um, when we talk about anchor cell therapy in patients, we have we have seen trials uh, with with uh, with uh, CAR NK cells being done with the same types of architectures that CAR T cells have been done. But really, um, there's a lot of activating domains that we're looking at, and and this is just more of an illustration slide. They really discuss uh, and really um, uh, that really can um, activate an NK cell specifically over a CAR T cell, for example, DAP10, CD3, Zeta, NKG2D. These are NK specific signaling domains, intracellular domains that can stimulate an NK cell over a CAR T cell. Uh, and so this is something that's really beneficial for NK cell therapy, not so much for T cell. And this is sort of where the field is moving a little bit, moving away from what we're what we're seeing in CAR T cell therapy and really starting to look at, can we activate these cells inside patients with NK specific signaling constructs, which is what uh, really our lab is doing a lot. But really, what are we? What do we know about immunotherapy in patients really starts with understanding the immune landscape in GBM. We want to understand what is the what are we really dealing with when we introduce an immunotherapy into a patient with brain tumors and what are is the landscape of that patient's brain tumor that can can or cannot be activated through cell therapy. So there's a lot of questions that whether there's functional NK cells to begin with, whether those cells can be stimulated for function. Um, can the drug, does it respond to drug treatment? Does the immune system of the patient wake up? Uh, because we know that CAR T therapy responses in numerous like brain tumor are really less than 20%, no matter what a manufacturing technique you use. I think there's of course, now new car architectures. We've heard about uh, if gated constructs and multi-specific cars, but really uh, manufacturing, whether you expand the cells for two weeks or three weeks, whether you transduce 20, 40, or 50%, whether you uh, get blood of a patient at a certain time, all of these things really uh, don't seem to affect the responses to the therapy, meaning there's other things than just the T cells um, and the quality of the T cells or NK cells that are introduced into the patient that drive the quality of response. These are some immunosuppressions that are active in brain tumors that have been recognized in the literature. And then I think that all of us ultimately are trying to deal with in various scenarios, whether it's the checkpoint inhibitors therapy, whether it's a viral therapy, whether it's 
um, you know, immunotherapy. So we know the tumors are heterogeneous. There's a lot of antigen escape. Um, this is something that's been recognized clinically. Um, they are in favorable condition of hypoxia. There's hypoxic cores that drive the expression of CD73 in patients. A lot of GBM patients have overexpressed CD73. It generates the adenosine. The adenosine then binds the TNK cells and inhibits them. There's also, of course, lactate and TGM beta meta metabolize that the cancer, brain cancer spits out, and that it sort of uses the protective shield against the attack by immune cells. Check with anybody immunotherapy, PD-1, TIM-3, TG, like 3 akg 2 a We don't fully understand the significance of all of them alone or in combination, but they are, um, we are seeing overexpression in certain patients of certain um, check with inhibitors, but they worth, they're worth um, investigating in terms of what do they do to the immune system. And of course, we have a lot of immune exclusion by dysregulated chemotactic factors. Uh, the extracellular matrix and the stroma of the tumor is very permissive to the homing of some immune cells. And so what we are, what we, what we saw um, uh, from my early slide is we, we, we looked at tumors of brain cancer patients initially, um, um, and we found that these patients have about under 10% of T cells in their tumors and uh, about three, three to 4% of T cells and about three to 4, 5%, a little more, just a little more of NK cells. So it's not a great proportion, but there are some cells there. Um, there's not that many, uh, but there are. The, the more difficulty is to getting the cells into the brain when they're adoptively transferred from outside of the patient. So there are multiple immunosuppressive immune cells that are found in these patients, and this is pretty consistent across a lot of patients. And so we really are dealing with a fairly immunosuppressive environment that really favors macrophage polarization and TREG activity, overactivity of effector immune cells such as TREG, but sorry, such as CDAT cells or NK cells. We, we collected uh, the brain's tissues from patients undergoing surgery. So this is patients that have just finished surgery within, you know, within a couple of hours of surgery and extracted these cells within about an hour of getting them out of the brain. Um, so the tissues were, were, were processed and we took up the NK cells. We found that there's, you can get about hundred thousand NK cells per gram of brain tumor tissue from each patient. And we wanted to ask a question, these brain cancer patients, with, these are patients with glioblastoma, um, adult patients with glioblastoma. And we wanted to understand that are these patients that have glioblastoma, are they uh, do they have an immunosuppressive environment, number one? And number two, what do the cells look like? And we found these cells are very abnormal. They don't express the same receptors that a healthy cell from either the patient's blood or even a healthy blood adult. So a healthy adult have, of course, functional immune system. These cells are really able to kill a lot. When you really take cells from the blood of a brain cancer patient, these cells are not able to kill any. You put them in, a, in an assay where to see um, to see whether they are able, they're completely unable to kill or produce IFN gamma, meaning they need the body, they're not really doing much. Um, and also they overexpress some receptors such as PD-1, it's upregulating in most patients. We've seen PD-1 pretty regularly and consistently upregulated in over you know, a couple dozen patients. Um, this is, again, this is an NK cell straight directly from the tumor uh, undergoing surgical resection. So we found, we found out that these cells are really um, immunosuppressed and not really the same as good cells. So we're really dealing with a very not functional immune environment. Second, second thing that we investigated in these patients, we investigated why are these cells not in the tumor? Why do we patients not have NK cells and or T cells, but really here not NK cells and why what are, what is in the tumor they don't like? Um, so we 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 looked at NK genes for of these cells just to, 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 to correlate the presence of NK cells with other inhibitor receptors. So this is CD73, GD2, um, CD155, all overexpressed checkpoint immunosuppressors in cancer. We found that NK cells were actively excluded from brain tumors of patients with high levels of GD2 and all those um, inhibitor receptors, but they liked the environments in the brains and the patients that a high proportion of CXL10, CCL5 chemotactic receptors that allowed the cells to home to the brain. So clearly it gave us it gave us indication, which kind of made sense a little bit, but um, we, we we wanted to see it really, uh, you know, hard, hard data um, to show that NK cells are excluded from environments that truly actively would promote their immunosuppression, and they are favored by environments such as chemokines and um, cytokines that are um, sort of doing, that are able to sort of treat the patients. But what have we learned in CAR engineered cell-based therapy for patients? Simple CARs that are being oxygen targeting, you heard this from an earlier talk today, are really are not sufficient. We are not going to be able to achieve durable responses in these patients, especially with refractive or um, refractive or aggressive tumors. Um, in brain brains that are not able to sort of um, achieve, that, that, that are based on just a single oxygen recognition. So what we're looking at, looking at multi cars, engagers, commission therapies, CRISPR knockout approaches and stim stimulation of these cells to sort of memory like AK cells to sort of get combination therapies and function. So what we did here, we also, to prove that chemotactic uh, environment is important in the brain, we also again took some more AK cells from brain cancer patients and we phenotyped them for presence of um, 
uh, chemotactic receptors, and we found that these cells of uh, these, these patients also dysregulate the chemotactic receptors. They actively promote the exclusion or the recruitment of the immune cells and, 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 and recruit abnormal soteriaxis and immunosuppressive cells. So this is pretty, um, this is a pretty, um, pretty um, proven effect that we've seen in a lot of patient samples and one of the receptors that the brain cancer expresses to um, to sort of uh, recruit these cells is CCR3 that is a ligand for CCL10 and CCL5, big T cell and NK cell homing receptors. So there's a lot of elements. Um, and sort of we use this information to develop some therapies, this knowledge with our patient uh, data and analysis. We use the patient to how can we really develop next generation therapies? They're really going beyond a simple CAR, a simple antigen, you know, checkpoint inhibitor or immunotherapy that we know is going to have a limited effect. You know, a lot of patients are really, really um, severely impacted by these tumors. I think we really are looking at, you know, environments where these CAR therapies can work in, you know, um, settings of res minimal residual disease, you know, after surgery, but either way, there's still the heterogeneity and the immunosuppression. And so we, we know that there's too much escape active immunotabolic suppression by producing lactic acid, by producing adenosine, and poor homing. So what we did here, we developed a triple CAR. This is the very first triple CAR used for glioblastoma. Um, this is, again, preclinical data, and we are now working with IU to initiate a clinical trial on, uh, on this triple CAR. It's the very first triple CAR in cell for any solid tumor, um, and we sort of jumped into brain cancer with this. We developed a, a, a CAR that targets three antigens on, on glioblastoma. One is the ligands of akg 2 which are um, up, down regulated in cancer. One is GD2, and one is CD73. A uh, peptide linker releases, cleaves the NK, engineered NK cell on the tumor and cleaves it, and uh, it blocks. Um, we know that one of the targets, CD73, we know that CD73 is an effective patient OS um, survival. It is a negative prostatic factor. It's overexpressed in a lot of patients. It generates an adenosine rich, you know, suppressive environment. This is kind of something that's proven. And, and so this is what the car, this is where triple car and cell platform looks like. Um, it really has a NKGD car, uh, a GD2 car that binds to the red GD2, and then there's a green peptide linker that gets cleaved a GBM associated proteases to cleave and block CD73. It's kind of a checkpoint immunotherapy built into a car NK cell, so you don't need to do the checkpoint blockade of CD73, but you really can rely on the cell producing its own checkpoint inhibitor antibody. We treated, um, we treated uh, this is some preclinical data again as we as we prepare an IND uh, to initiate a trial of this. We initiated these. Uh, uh, Primary patient derived uh, GBM, GBM43 cells that were implanted into the mice. Uh, and as kind of skipped on the slide, this is all published, so I don't want to go into too much detail. But we combine this with the treatment of autophagy. So if you inhibit GBM autophagy with chloroquine, which alone is not really an effective treatment um, for GBM, but it doesn't provide an environment rich of chemotactic uh, agents. So if we actually combine autophagy inhibition with chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, we were able to get really dramatic effect on tumor survival in these mice uh, that are really truly not responsive to NK cell therapy. We treated these mice with NK cells by themselves, um, and even T cells have a very limited ability to kill, and these cells are just immunosuppressed right away. These tumors come back, um, and again, these mice are treated, of course, intracranially. There's a very, uh, we are working at imaging MRI with IU collaborators to understand how can we traffic immune cells that are given non-intracranially into the brain. Of course, it's a really tough proposition, but it's something, of course, we're interested in. Um, and then we also saw a lot of enhancement of CCL5 and CCL10. Um, and finally, really for the end of the, the talk, I want to focus on a next generation therapy for, um, I think, brain tumors that we are um, now, uh, we've done, this is in review right after publication, we're looking at stem cells. We really are one to, every, all the data you've seen so far is that we blood, blood from donors. Um, we take cells from blood and this is not sustainable for long-term or for manufacturing, for scale up for multiple patients. So we really are looking at uh, IPSCs we have, uh, we have developed from adult dermal fibroblasts, our group program stem cells into pluripotent stem cells. They're taking over differentiation process over 40 days where they're made into, a, into a mature NK cells. We then developed a Synoch car. You've heard of gate, uh, if gated cars um, earlier in the talk. We have a simple one. It's based on, a, we have a similar one. It's based on a Synoch, um, um, uh, Synoch signal and fixed in nature where we took a, um, a notch tra transcriptional factor, GAL4 VP64. We combine it with a with a CD5 55 car um, that binds TIGIT, that's the big immunosuppressor in brain cancer. And then once that binds, it triggers the release again of CD, uh, CD73 so that the, all the effects happen in the tumor. Huge effects on tumor growth. And these are all stem cell derived at IPSCs. This is for our knowledge, the very first stem cell based NK cell therapy for glioblastoma to achieve this kind of response in terms of in a sort of dual uh, targeting blockade. We believe that the future of brain tumors with engineered immune cells are going to be to look at concerts that can target 
such multiple factors in the marine mark, tuna market environment because of the, such um, limited response without outside of that. So this is, this is all I wanted to share today. Um, I hope I gave a little bit of a flavor for some of the efforts that we have had in brain tumor immunotherapy. Um, and uh, I want to thank everybody for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for a very uh, a deep review of the NK uh, impact in glioblastoma immunotherapy. Um, it looks like the, um, the, the P73 and TIGIT and all these inhibitors of immune function are the targets that we have to uh, um, knock out to get these therapies to work. Uh, it's, it's very interesting to see your approach. Thank you so much for your, you. your talk. Thank you.